Hello everyone and welcome to the game of the day for day two of the Chessable Masters by Chess24. Today we had Group B playing with uh, a lot of the players from the Candidates Tournament, surprisingly enough. We're, uh, we're in this group. The groups were done at random, so it's just a bit of a coincidence, but we have Caruana, we have MVL, we have Timur Rajabov, uh, we have Anish Giri. Um, so it's a, it is very much a group. Jan Nepomnesi, so it's very much a, and Dingli Ren. They are all candidates uh, by coincidence. So the game of the day today features a little bit of everything. I picked this game between MVL and Fabiano Caruana. It's a little bit of an opening debate, which I find interesting. Then there are some positional concepts uh, that go very well with our hashtag study chess uh, with Chessable for this event. And then it ends with a beautiful tactical motif to end the game. Actually, in Checkmate, you will see Checkmate on the board, which is always kind of fun. So we will go through this game. Uh, in its entirety. So we'll start from the beginning. So MVL, by the way, has been playing uh, D4 quite a bit since the beginning of these uh, online, since uh, since quarantine has begun, it seems like he's shifted to playing D4. Uh, you know, we've just, we've debated a few times whether this is in order to hide his preparation for the candidates where he normally plays E4 and uh, or whether he's uh, just experimenting with something else. And maybe this is something that will force his opponents to waste a lot of time preparing for uh, on top of preparing for E4. So but Fabiano has been playing the Slav. And so it's interesting here that uh, MVL plays this Queen C2 variation, which was also played by Nakamura. And what's interesting is that Fabiano has continued to improve on his play. Uh, if you have not done so yet, I highly recommend that you check out the course by Sam Shanklin on this variation on the semi-slav that is available on Chessable. It's a great course, very detailed, uh, but goes through this variation as well and would prepare you very well, for example, for this game against MVL. And this is especially important because let me get you to the position here after queen b3, queen b6, knight bd2, which is a well-known position for this variation. And if you have studied Sam's scores, you would know that rook d8 is the most precise move. In the first game that Hikaru Nakamura played against Fabiano uh, in the Magnus Cross Invitational, Fabiano played knight b to d7, which is an inaccurate move. And after knight c4, which is similar to the game, queen a6, bishop f4, the problem here is that the d6 square is weak, and white either will be able to play uh, bishop d6 or, in some cases, knight d6. And in that game uh, between Fabiano and Hikaru, the first game that they played, after knight b6, bishop d6, black uh, struggle to equalize was, was uh, at some point worse, and this opening position should be worse for, for black. A couple of hours later, Fabiano played rook d8, and now in Sam's Sam Shanklin's course, this move is the recommended move. And you could even go back uh, on our uh, channels and find the after show that we did with Sam on this, and he talked about at length why rook d8 is is the best move. Fabiano did play it the second time around, and now he plays it again again in this game against MVL. Uh, and the opening here does seem to be a reasonable success for Black. At least, you know, Black did not have any opening problems. So the game continues with knight c4, queen to a6. We don't really want to trade queens here um, because white has, first of all, a threat of knight b6, but also the knight can come to a5 and these pawns will be weak. So we don't want to trade queens. We play queen a6. Uh, and, and this is a position where if black can organize, mo mobilize their pieces, play knight d7, bishop e4 to close up this diagonal for the bishop and eventually play c5, black can have a very nice position. This is black's plan. So uh, there are a few things that white can do. Hikaru in, in the aforementioned game played bishop d2 and after knight b to d7, he played rook fc1, bishop e4. Black had no, no opening problems in that game. In this game, instead, MVL plays bishop g5, probably a little bit of preparation, uh, definitely a, a playable move, doesn't really change the plan or the assessment of the position, though black is very solid. Knight d7, rook e1, Fab Fabiano plays h6 to force that bishop to decide what it wants to do, makes makes a lot of sense, also creates uh, luft for the king as we call it, bishop f4, knight b6, knight to e5. And now Fabiano plays queen a4, uh, an interesting move, not the not the only move. You could also play to to prepare uh, to prepare c5 here, but it is it is a move that makes sense. Eventually, now that the knight is not coming to a5, the knight is on e5 now. It it seems to be a reasonable uh, possibility to take on b3. 
So he plays bishop to d2. The, the idea of bishop d2, there's a few ideas with bishop d2, but one of the things is that if black plays here and plays bishop c2, which is sometimes an idea uh, here, there's actually a few moves. Knight c4 is one, but white could also potentially play play b4. So, um, so he plays bishop to d2, bishop e4. The bishop often comes here again to neutralize this bishop on g2. And the bishop has a it's a, it's a nice square and it's it's kind of uh, awkward for white to get the that bishop out of its out of that square. You want to play something like knight d2, but if you do that, often white black will be happy to trade the bishop the bishop uh, the light squared bishops, especially because they have this pawn center that has pawns all in the light square, so it makes a lot of sense. Um, not white trades. Again, in this game, it's, it seems like white did not achieve. This is not a position where white has any real pressure against black. Black should eventually be able to play c5 uh, and be equal. Another plan potentially to play a5, a4. So Fabiano would have been pretty happy, I think, in this position. And he plays bishop a5, rook d5, bishop c3. And now Fabiano plays c5, and that seems like a very reasonable move. But uh, there was also the possibility of playing a5. Uh, and I think Fabiano may have been concerned about knight c4 here. And, but this would have been an interesting, slightly less balanced position. It's important that the bishop on e4 here controls uh, the b1 square. Because if white could play rook b1 and put pressure on this pawn, that would be a little bit of a problem. But in the absence of that, it seems like uh, these pawns could end up being a weakness for, for, for white. And black might be able to play c5 somewhere. So this was an interesting way to, to approach this position. And another thing is that black could play rook to d8 first. Sorry, instead of c5, play rook to d8 and potentially uh, play a5, a4 next, where now they have a square for the, the knight if white plays knight c4. So there were a few ways. I don't think there's anything wrong with c5, but uh, Fabiano does start to go wrong in a few moves, and we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens here. So e3, rook d8, preparing potentially to put the knight on d5 to harass this bishop a little bit. The knight could also from there come to b4, threaten forks. Makes a lot of sense. Rook d1, knight d5, bishop a5. So he doesn't want to let black play knight b4. That's why he stays on his diagonal. Also wins a tempo against the rook. Rook c8, b6 was a possibility too. Rook c1, b6. We're going to get to the key moment here. Bishop e1. And this is where I think things start to go a little bit wrong uh, for Fabiano here. Uh, it seems like most most sort of waiting moves would have been okay here. Uh, for example, a move like rook c7, intending to play rook c8 and eventually take on d4 would have been pretty good, I think. Uh, maybe he was concerned about a plan like bishop f1 with the idea of playing either bishop a6 or knight d2. But it seems like this position is just okay. If white gets the bishop on a6, it doesn't do that much. You can play rook to d8. The bishop can actually become a target to knight b4 sometimes. Uh, and I think this position is, is just solid for black. For example, knight d2, the bishop goes back to h7. Positionally speaking, black is totally fine. It's not easy for white to prepare e4. And eventually black will be able to take on d4 and should be perfectly okay. Here again, they have this idea to play knight b4 as well. So I rather like black's position here. Uh, instead, Fabiano played a5 and it's a natural move in some ways. You know, you, you would like to play a4, potentially create a weakness on the, on the uh, queen side for white. The problem with it is that it's a it's a very committal move, and so this pawn this pawn structure with b6 a5, when a knight can come to c4 can be can be a real problem. And MVL just plays a4 here, uh, and already we see that the 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 light squares here are very weak. And in the long term, when it seems likely that these bishops will be traded for one another, it seems like this is the start of a a bit of some some problems for for black here. So rook c7, knight c4, rook c8, pawn takes c5. And MVL from now on, by the way, plays extremely well the, the, the rest of this game. Knight to d4. And already I think the position is unpleasant for black. I don't think it's necessarily worse per se. It's possible that, that especially with incredible precision, with a lot of time that black could, could hold. You know, For example, a move like rook d8 maybe, but it becomes awkward because the, these knights are jumping. Uh, there's always going to be potential pins on the on the the C or the D file, and because this pawn is at least uh, optically a weakness, if White can ever get to play F3 E4 at some point, 
it's 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 just a position that's it's on the verge of being problematic without necessarily being problematic yet. But here, Fabiano probably decides that he's worse and decides to trade on d4. And trading on d4, after that, it seems like it's already difficult to hold. So um, you can see why he did it, because he's on the verge of getting pushed back, right? If the knight comes to b5, we play f3, e4, he's on the verge of, of, on the verge of being pushed back, and he didn't want to just wait patiently for, for things to get worse. Uh, but after this... Surprisingly enough, black hasn't done anything that seemed obviously wrong other than potentially that move a5, which created weaknesses. And now it's already difficult because the problem is that the, the knights here, while they look good, are actually not very stable because white has this plan to play e4. And uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's just very difficult with without the knights having an anchor, uh, then the, the, the pawn structure becomes a real, a real problem. So he plays knight to d7 e4, knight f6, rook d1. And here, um, here the problems are, again, are, 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 are clear. White can, has simple plans, right? Like playing f3, bishop f2 to bring the bishop against this pawn, play rook d6. Uh, sometimes e5 can be a threat. There's just a lot, a lot of problems here on the queen side. Rook b8, never a happy move when you have to make a move like that, you know, leaving the open file to protect the pawn. It's never a happy moment. F3, uh, king h7. There's not there's not actually a lot of plans for black here. He's kind of reduced to being passive. Uh, b5 doesn't work because this a pawn is falling all the time. So that's a, that's a big problem. King h7, g4. g4 is a very nice move. It does a few things. Uh, there's the plan in the game of playing h4, g5, but the other thing is that the bishop is coming potentially to g3, targeting these rooks, and it's difficult. It makes it difficult to continue to defend both the knight uh, and and the, the the pawn on b6. So he, he plays e5. e5 is a positional concession because after that move, it's it's very difficult to get an anchor uh, an anchored knight. Rook to d6, knight c5. And by the way, so here this is this is a bit of a key moment. Knight c5 is sort of a desperado, a, a last attempt to muddy the waters before the position just becomes uh, positionally lost. Uh, but uh, the, the 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 main problem is that b5 all, is always met by knight takes a5, and it doesn't seem like black is able to get any real counterplay here. Um, and so knight c5 is a move where, and if he doesn't do anything, then eventually white will play either h4, g5, which is going to threaten to win a piece, uh, and potentially bishop f2 targeting this pawn, and there's just no no counterplay for black. So it's sort of surprising how from, from a position that seemed to be very solid, very stable, it got to be to be quite, uh, quite bad. Uh, so black plays knight c5, knight takes e5, knight takes b3. And now MVL, it's quite interesting that instead of trying to consolidate in a more prosaic way, he continues to play for the attack. And he assesses correctly that he has time to do that because Black's, Black's point here is they're saying, okay, my position is garbage positionally, but I'm going to create a pass pawn very quickly and it's going to be something that you have to deal with. And so he was willing to, to, to take that gamble since the position was so difficult. Um, but MVL correctly calculated that, that his attack... Uh, which is which involves uh, playing for a mating net against a black king is actually quick enough. So h4, b5, g5. He played knight to h5. Knight e8 was another possibility here. Uh, and white would probably play rook d7. And amazingly, in all these positions, there is there is real real trouble for 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 the king here. Uh, the king is really in in just a, a bad spot. So even though this pawn is getting all the way up the board, um, this position here is already losing because at king g8, we have knight c6. So we have knight e7, rook f8 mate. Um, instead of a3, black can try and move like rook c8 to parry that this, not this arrow, the, the threat of knight c6. Uh, but it's it doesn't solve all the problems because white has other ways to, to continue the attack. And this is what's surprising about this position that this attack against the king, even with the a pawn that looks like it's about to become a queen, is strong enough to basically be winning for white. Um, I'll spare you all the variations because it is very complicated, but I think the key part here is that MVL's instinct was correct because I don't think in the amount of time that they had in this game that he was able to calculate all of this. So it's pretty impressive actually. 
knight h5 was played instead of knight e8. He goes knight to d7, a strong move. He's attacking the rook. If the rook leaves the eighth rank by going to b7, then we have knight f8, king g8, and rook to d8, which causes all kinds of problems. So, uh, so he's forced to stay on the eighth rank when white can get a very strong pass pawn of his own. So now both sides, we each have a pass pawn, a4, b6, rook b7, bishop b4, nice move, uh, stops, stops the pawn from advancing any further for the time being. Knight f4, king g3. The position is already lost here, so I'm not going to go into too much detail um, until we get to the, the very beautiful final position here where white plays king g4. Their idea, if black doesn't do anything uh, anything threatening here, is probably going to be to play f4, f5, um, which is going to further, further cause problems for the king. Um, so he plays rook to c2. And rook to c2 allows a beautiful finish, which is also the tactic of the day today. This one is worth is worth pausing the video for a second if you haven't seen it yet. Pause the video, give yourself a little bit of time, see if you can find it. But I'm going to continue for those uh, since, since, of course, it's possible to pause. White can play g6. And so this is a little bit like a Greek gift sacrifice. The, the, the king is lured forward. Uh, you can't play pawn takes g6 because the knight is falling and after which there's still going to be an attack. Um, king g8 loses in um, many, many different ways actually, but one of the, probably the prettiest one is to play rook takes e6, pawn takes e6, and then knight to c5. And uh, after rook b8, knight a6. So this is sort of a computer computer-like variation with b7, b8, but it's the prettiest one. If you don't want to calculate such things, then there are moves like king f5, for example, is extremely strong, uh, you know, with with a position that's that's crushing now, we're threatening to take. Uh, also possible is gf with knight e5. Basically, everything wins. So Fabiano, seeing that he's completely lost, decides to take the pawn. I'm sure he saw the resulting checkmate, but he this is sort of a, a you can call it a gentleman's way of... of uh, of playing where you let yourself be mated, which you know mates on the board don't happen too often with uh, in these games between extremely strong players, but it's always nice to see. And so now again, beautiful finish here, knight f8. So the, the, the king cannot come back to h7, which is the idea of this g6 uh, gift. And since the e6 knight is pinned, black is forced, only has one legal move, king to f8, f6. Now white continues to lure the king uh, Lure the king forward. I said this in my explanation to the tactic of the day, but you know you always want to look at checks. As Larry Christensen said, maybe someone else had said it before. Uh, always check it might be mate. It's always good looking at checks when you're calculating variations because they're they force the response, and so the variation is narrow. It's easy to keep going uh, and see if it leads to something great. So in this case, the king goes forward. And now an important nuance, he plays rook six to d5. It's tempting to bring the other rook. The difference is that we want the bishop to cover all the escape squares for the king. So when we play rook six to d5, king f6, that square is covered, which allows checkmate in one. Uh, the other way would also be pretty good, but, uh, but not quite as good because the king would be able to go to e7. So with this, uh, the game ends with a beautiful checkmate. And there you have it, the game of the day for the second day of the Chessable Masters by Chess24. We will be back for more tomorrow, and I hope you will be here to, uh, to join me. Thank you very much.